Tourism in Hawaii began um, in the early 1860s when Kilauea volcano was all the rage. Um, and when, it, when Kilauea was one of the world's uh, premier or prime attractions at the time. Um, in 1865, a little grass structure was created at the rim of the volcano um, and later became known as the Volcano House. Um, on the rim of Hale Maumau Crater, and it offered shelter to visitors and technically became known as Hawaii's first hotel. The visitor industry unfolded as the plantation era took place. And in 1901, it grew even more. Hmm. Um, tourism became a promotion in Hawaii in 1903. And that year, about 2,000 visitors came to Hawaii. Throughout the years, tourism in Hawaii has grown and inflated uh, the vital resources our islands have to offer. Traditional sites, resources, practices, and even our language has been exploited at the expense of tourism. Through the efforts of Native Hawaiian organizations and people, we are working to rewrite the script of how tourism should be in Hawaii. So mahalo for joining us today. We'd like to welcome all of you from near and far. We know that we have people all over the nation. So mahalo for taking the time to join us. This webinar is presented on behalf of the Office of Indian Economic Development, um, as well as in collaboration with the Office of Native Hawaiian Relations and Tribal Tech as well. So a little bit of housekeeping rules. Uh, this webinar will be recorded. Everyone is gonna be muted during the presentation. However, everyone does have access to the chat box. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask, um, go ahead and pop it in the box and it will be compiled and answered, asked and answered toward the, towards the end of the webinar. All slides and the recording will be made available to participants. Um, and a survey link will also be put up into the chat for everyone to complete. So if you can take a little bit of time after this and get that completed, we would greatly appreciate it. We'd like to start off today by giving um, some time to Denise, who will be introducing um, some of our members of our OIED department. So Denise, I will give you the floor. Hey, thank you so much, Iwilani. Um, Shawan Eskenehe, greetings everyone. My name is Denise Litz. And I'm the Chief for the Division of Economic Development in the Office of Indian Economic Development. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar. Um, this is an opportunity for us to highlight some of the projects that we've done through our collaborations with the Office of Native Hawaiian Relations through the Native American Tourism and Improving Visitor Experience Act, which is actually referred to as the Native Act. These are funds that we have utilized over the last four or five years to support tribes, tribal organizations, and Native Hawaiian organizations um, to support um, tourism across Indian country and in Hawaii. So uh, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, Anna LeBeau is our director. She is from Omaha Tribe of Nebraska. Um, that's her contact information. You'll have available uh, all of the information for our staff in the, um, in the PowerPoint. Next slide, please. So we have two teams. Um, the first team is the economic development specialists. We have Janelle Green, who's citizen Potawatomi Nation. Um, she covers our Alaska and Southwest zone. Uh, Jim Henry is my dude. He's in our Northwest zone. And then we have Rebecca Horse Chief, who is Osage and Pawnee, and she is uh, covering our Eastern zone. Next slide, please. So uh, our other team is our grants management team. Um, this is led by Dennis Wilson, who's Taz Pueblo. He's our grant management specialist and supported and working with Elizabeth Callahan, who's from Choctaw Nation, and she is our program analyst. Uh, next slide, please. 
So part of the efforts and this webinar is supported by our training and technical assistance team. We have Dr. Priscilla Belize, project manager. Uilani Koryorkman is the TA coordinator. Uh, Dr. Kelly Lachance is also a TA coordinator focused on native language specialists. And Freddie Gipp, who is also a TA coordinator and business development specialist. Uh, next slide, please. So I, it's my turn to introduce um, Brad Kaleolo Wong, who is with the Office of Native Hawaiian Relations. Um, it's such a pleasure to have him with us. Um, he is a friend and colleague, um, and we work very closely together to ensure that we're supporting Native Hawaiian organizations. Brad, I'll turn it over to you. Awesome. Mahalo nui, Denise, and, and uh, great to see you again. It's been a, it's been a couple of months, so um, good to see you again. And uh, like she said, um, our, our office is, is uh, within the Department of Interior as well, um, and we work closely with uh, the OIED um, uh, for this uh, whole EHAC funding and, and um, other issues as well. Um, our office is uh, based in Hawaii. We have um, three we have um, three staff here in Hawaii: myself, uh, Lisa uh, Oshiro Suganuma, and Stanton Enomoto, um, and then one um, one person in DC, Kaiini Kaloi. Um, our office uh, is basically the, the liaison between the Department of the Interior and the, the um, Native Hawaiian community. And um, we take our, you know, th there are a lot of um, issues that, that do arise um, with the Native Hawaiian community and, and, and things like um, consultation processes and, and uh, you know, federal lands and things like that. So we, we, we take our job pretty seriously to try to help um, help our community to to advocate for them and to, to get them what they need. Um, it, what the uh, one of the projects that we are proud of and and, and that we've have been co um, collaborating with um, the OIED on and what this um, uh, this webinar is 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 our Ho'ihi grant program. Um, oh, thanks, Freddie, um, for posting that. Um, and Ho'ihi uh, for us, um, Ho'ihi means to. Um, there's a there, there's an olelo no eo or why saying it's a e hoihi aku e hoihi mai. So if you if you give respect, um, you you receive it back, yeah. Um, and so that's kind of the foundation that we've set our grant program on, um, on on these more um, traditional perspectives of of what uh, tourism is. And so the folks talking today will will share some of those projects here in Hawaii. Um, and you know, I, I won't go too too much into the history of tourism in Hawaii, but it, it, it there has been some some major impacts that we we all have we all have felt, um, and so not just from our from our own work experiences, but from our personal ones as well, um, given how um, uh, given the impacts of it here in Hawaii. So hopefully, we can sh our folks can share a little bit about that today, and I'm just happy to be here to. To even give this and to listen in on, on some of these awesome speakers. So uh, thanks, Ui, and uh, I send it back to you. Yes, we are very excited to have our our gang here, and I'd like to just share a little bit about the purpose of our webinar. Yes, the purpose is we want to showcase and highlight Hawaii and all of the wonderful things that our organization and our people have been doing when it comes to taking a wrangle on tourism and doing tourism our way. Um, however, we also want to be able to kind of share, yeah, Nanai Kikumu, look to the source is, is the title of our webinar, and we want to be able to share with other tribal nations as well as other even within our own, with our within our own pai aina, yeah, we want to share about um, wonderful things that other organizations are doing to help, um, you know, to be able to share that manao with everyone. So the goal of our webinar um, is to provide a platform for discussing how the principles of culturally responsive as well as regenerative tourism, um, as demonstrated here in Hawaii, can be adapted to benefit tribal nations, um, but as I mentioned, as well as other organizations within our Pai Aina. Through exploring these parallels, we aim to foster a deeper understanding of culturally sensitive tourism and its immense potential for enhancing community engagement, sustainability, and socioeconomic growth within diverse tribal nations. Um, so just a little bit about why we're here today.
Now I'd like to introduce really why we all came here um, is to hear from our very wonderful panelists. Um, so we have, first we have Joy Lynn Paman. She's the executive director of two nonprofits. Um, one of them is Ao Ao on a local EO Maui, um, and they are devoted to revitalizing a native fine fish pond in Kihei, South Maui, and also the Kimokeo Foundation, which is dedicated to preserving Hawaiian language and culture through our children, to the children um, of Hawaii. Jolene is a native Hawaiian herself, whose ohana has lived on Maui for generations. She holds a bachelor's degree in marine science from the University of Hawaii at Hilo, um, with an emphasis in Olelo Hawaii, as well as fine studies. So welcome, Joylin. Mahalo for joining us. <laughs> um, our next presenter we have is Olu Campbell. Olu is the president and CEO of Hawaii Land Trust, um, also known as HILT. Olu has worked in a various capacities in the public and private sectors on topics such as conservation, community empowerment, education, native Hawaiian rights, food systems, climate change, housing and development, law and business as well. Since 2018, he has served as the community and government relations manager for Kamehameha Schools and has previous, was previously a legacy land specialist for the Office of Native Hawaiian Affairs where he conducted a community-driven land use planning and stewardship for about 26,000 acres of culturally and ecologically significant lands. Currently, Olu serves as the Honolulu Economic Revitalization Commission and recently concluded his term as a member of the State of Hawaii Depan um, Depan Department of Land and Natural Resources Forest Stewardship Committee on which he served since 2018. <clears throat> Now Olu's hat is president and CEO of Hawaii, Hawaii Island Land Trust. So welcome Olu and mahalo so much for joining us today. And lastly, we have Auntie Cindy Punihaole. Auntie Cindy is the director of the Kahalu'u Bay Education Center, um, which is a program within the Kohala Center on Hawaii Island. She has a 15 year history of successful community development and public education experience and oversees all programs and activities at Kahalu'u Bay Education, education Center, including successful volunteer programs such as Reef Te Teach and Citizen Science. Reef Teach includes more than 400 volunteers and provides reef etiquette education at the Bay. Citizen Science engages volunteers to monitor the base health by collecting water quality samples and other environmental data. And Cindy also initiated the first cauliflower flower coral spawn enclosure at Kahalu'u in 2018, um, a reef rejuvenation strategy that has continued since then. This successful project is embraced by the community and serves as a model for other bays around the island. In 2021, state parks at Wailea Bay on Hawaii Island followed Kahalu'u's lead by commencing its first cauliflower closure, coral closure days as well. So mahalo to all of you and welcome and thank you for joining us today. We are excited to hear your mana'o. Okay, so I'd like to give the floor to Joy Lynn uh, so she can share a little bit more in depth with us about the hana they have been doing on Maui and all of the great mana'o she has to share. So aloha Joy Lynn. Aloha mai kako e na maka maka o ku keia pai aina a me ka pai aina o ke ahonua ni. Aloha, my name is Joy Lynn Paman. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Ui, and I mahalo sincerely to um, all of the supporters of the Ho'ihi program because it has definitely created a new opportunity for our nonprofit organization. It's named Ao Ao Onalokoi O Maui, or the Association of the Fish Ponds of Maui, and was established back in 1998. And it is located on the south shore of Maui, where we are restoring Ko'ie'ie Fish Pond, a fish pond that was built hundreds of years ago. 
And our whole goal is to restore it so that it remains here for another 400, 500 years. Um, when it was formed, it was formed by people of that coastline. And if you understand Kihei and Maui, this is very much an area where not many Hawaiians exist anymore. There are families associated with the island, but uh, that area, but it was really just um, newcomers that moved to Maui that were curious about what this fish pond is and um, decided to make a nonprofit organization to preserve it because they understood how it, important it was culturally and historically. And so when we first got there, the fish pond was barely able to be seen at, at low tides and um, throughout the many decades that I've been with it since 98, um, I've definitely seen it change. And one of the major changes that we've seen is that we have a lot of visitors that come to the um, site and they don't always understand that it is a cultural site. They think it's there for turtles, um, to see turtles or a nice shallow swimming spot. So our goal with Ho'ihi was to work with the community to have them understand better that this is much more, uh, has much richer historical value and cultural value and to have people continue to respect it. So through the Ho'ihi grant and the, sec the middle slide there, we were able to hire new staff to help me do restoration on the wall regularly as well as work in the community. And um, to the right there in the third picture, you can see one of our staff uh, uh, explaining to our school groups about what the fish pond is about. And Ui, can you go to the next slide, please? So on the left, this is one of the, the major impacts that Ho'ihi has helped us do is create a, a regular presence on the beach at Ko'ie'e Fish Pond, where our community and outreach staff uh, just hang out at the at, on the shore of the fish pond, but then they're readily available and proactive in approaching tourists that come there and it, actually anyone who comes to the fish pond and uh, explain what exactly it's about. Um, and in the middle there is Daniel Kahayali'i. He was one of our hired staff that has um, worked on the south portion of our wall and has rebuilt a good portion with um, his crew. And to the right, this is the reason why we have a lot of people come to the pond is because they've heard that there's a lot of turtles here now. And that's a result over the restoration we've done in the last 20 years. <laughs> And also the location of our site is in a very public place. We have a county park right there at the fish pond, a condominium, as well as the Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary Federal Site. So visitors come regularly to that general area for recreation. And so they just assume that this location is there for pleasure, but through the Ho'ihi grant, we've been able to take that to another level and be able to um, educate our community that it's much more than that. And we also are able to host school groups and community organizations that learn more about fish ponds and um, help us restore the wall too. Mahalo Nui. <laughs> Oh, mahalo so much. That's exactly what we need to do. Yeah, educate the visitors as well as our kiki. Um, mahalo for sharing all of that, Joy Lynn. We'd like to bring up Olu Campbell, who is, uh, as I mentioned, the CEO of Hawaii Land Trust. Olu? Yeah, aloha. So grateful to be here. Thank you so much to our host for putting on this panel and for supporting um, the work that all of our organizations are doing here in Hawaii. Um, yeah, so my name is Olu Campbell, born, raised, currently live uh, here in Kaimuki, Oahu, right up the hill from Waikiki, the really the center of tourism in Hawaii in many ways. Um, so this topic is very personal to me, and I've you know seen throughout my life a lot of the both positive and, and negative impacts of tourism in Hawaii, and it's one of the reasons that I do the work that I do today. Um, so thank you for for having me on this panel. Um, 
I currently serve as the CEO of Hawaii Land Trust. Hawaii Land Trust is Hawaii's only statewide, local, um, nationally accredited land trust. And we do a whole bunch of different things. Um, a lot of people know us for the work that we do in land acquisition. So we work to acquire either in fee or easements over lands that have significant value to our community. Um, sometimes we're acquiring lands that we end up owning ourselves. Sometimes we help uh, other families or other organizations acquire land and help them grow their own capacity. We also do landscape scale, ecosystem, and cultural resource stewardship. Um, we have currently seven, soon to be eight, preserves across the, the Paiaina that we steward ourselves. We also have 51. Um, as of last Friday, we closed on our 51st uh, easement that we have all across the Paiaina, and we steward all of those easements to make sure that the values that we're trying to conserve on those lands um, remain for the benefit of our people and, and for our place. We also do uh, Aina, and uh, for those who are not familiar, Aina is our, our word for land, uh, land-based and culture-based tour, uh, sorry, not tourism, but education um, that is sometimes for, for tourists and it's also sometimes for our keiki. We have thousands of students uh, who come through our education programs um, across across the Pai Aina, and we provide educational curriculum that's tailored to them based on things that are relevant to their homes that they live in uh, and their places that are significant to them. Uh, we also provide support for other organizations uh, in various ways as fiscal sponsor or uh, to provide advice on stewardship and, and other things. Um, we mostly interact with tourists um, in, in a few ways, we or, or the tourism industry in a few ways. We have our preserves that are, at least to a certain extent, open to public access. And so we have tourists that visit our sites um, for recreation, hiking, uh, other kinds of things. Uh, we have tourists that come through our educational programs and our volunteer programs, and they participate with us in those programs. We also work with the tourism industry um, by having employees of of companies who work in tourism coming out to our sites and participating in our programs, um, or we also work with them in other things like fundraising, for example, to support the work that we do. Uh, the sites that you see here are sites that are being supported by the Hawaii grant um, to do stewardship and aina based education. Uh, the top left there is the, on the island of Kauai, that's the Kahili Beach on the North Shore. It's a coastal dune uh, and estuarian habitat there, high quality seabird. Uh, area along with a whole bunch of other recreational resources that they really, the community really relies upon, um, along with subsistence resources. Uh, on the top left, uh, top right, we have Mauna Wila Heiau, it's on the north shore of Oahu. Uh, we have Aina-based education programs happening there where we have uh, that site being uh, an extension of the classroom of the local elementary school, and we have students coming there to participate in learning. Uh, in that picture, they're, they're building a traditional hale. Last year, we constructed the first traditional house structure in Haula for the first time in over 100 years. And this year we're working on the second traditional hale in Haula in over 100 years. Um, on the bottom two pictures are both on Maui on the, on the left, bottom left is our Nu'u refuge out in Kaupo on the south east side of Maui. And then on the bottom right is our Waihe'e coastal dunes um, refuge um, on the north shore of, of Maui. Yeah, so thank you again for having having me here and really appreciate the work that's been put into this panel. Mahalo so, mahalo so much, Olu. Uh, mahalo for sharing all of those wonderful things. Uh, we'd now like to bring up um, Auntie Cindy, Puniha Ole, so she can share a little bit about um, the wonderful things that they are doing over on Hawaii Island with the Kohala Center. So aloha, Auntie. If you're not already, Auntie, I think gotta unmute. Sorry, and before I sorry, before okay. I bring Auntie in, I know we had quite a few people who joined after we started. So just oh. kind of as a heads up, um, if you do have any questions, just go ahead and pop it in the chat. And Mahalo Fred, he's also putting some um links to the Office of Native Foreign Relations, um, as well as Hawaii Island Land, uh, Hawaii Land Trust. So if you need more information, you can um, click on those links. So without further ado, <laughs> welcome, Auntie. <laughs> Aloha, Kako. 
Mahalo. It's, we are so grateful for Ui and all of you for inviting the Kohala Center here today. Um, wanted to uh, share you know, a little bit about the Kohala Center. Uh, we are an independent community-based nonprofit focused on research, education, and Aina stewardship for healthier ecosystems. So for us, we envision a state of Pono in which individuals realize their potential, uh, contributing to the very best to one another, as well as to the community. And in exchange for a meaningful and happy life. Very simple, um, but very, very grateful to have an opportunity to go out and share in, in different parts of the, the, our uh, island. The Kohala Center is an umbrella of different programs. The uh, slide that you're viewing right now is a slide of Kahalu Bay Education Center's program called Reef Teach. Reef Teach was a program created by the University of Hawaii Sea Grant back in 2000. And in 2006, uh, asked the Kohala Center to please come and help them expand their program because at Kahalu Bay and Beach Park, a county park, it's only a very small 4.2 acre park, but it experiences over 400,000 visitors a year. And so um, the visitors, and not that they were doing these things on purpose, but because they did, know, they did not know any better, they would be harassing our wildlife, um, sitting on the turtles, flipping them over, seeing if they could um, re, uh, re flip themselves, chasing our uh, ear, all of these things. And so community, they were actually loving the bay to death. So the community came to the Kohala Center and asked, if we could help Malama and, and create a program that, is, uh, that would help educate our visitors to the Bay. And so I, for me, my family is of uh, uh, the West uh, Kona, uh, Kona area, uh, leeward side of Hawaii Island and I am Kamaina of the area. So uh, they, we decided that we would accept that. And so today we have over 400 volunteers, uh, community volunteers, stewards, stewards, and these are some of them. These are my youth leaders, they're Keiki, and they help us introduce our work and educate the visitors on reef etiquette. Next slide, please, Ui. Next slide, please, Ui. And see if you can, what I was mentioning before, this is what we experience through the year at Kahalu. Hundreds and thousands of visitors because it is one of the most beautiful bays on the island of Hawaii. And we must protect our resources. So for us, it is about refocusing the, the way we have in the past uh, welcomed our tourists on a commer commercial basis to looking at our places as a vahipana and to be able to educate with uh, traditional knowledge as well as Western understanding, but being the foundation always as what our way of life was and is today. Next slide, please. And so what we had mentioned in, in, as she introduced me, 
in 2018, I decided that we would ask the county and the state to close the park for coral, uh, cauliflower coral spawning. Because in 2015, we had a major uh, coral bleaching across the Hawaiian Islands and in Kahalu Bay, 95% of our cauliflower corals died. And um, we only had 18 heads in the bay, coral heads strong enough to reproduce. And so we, the county allowed us to close for a couple of days a half a day. And, and so um, it was very successful. Our educators, Reef Teach volunteers were there explaining to the community why we were closing. The following year, because we were so successful, we closed for two days. And now we are closing a whole week. And from 18 coral heads that we had in 2018, uh, today we have over 80. And so we have over 10,000 uh, juvenile babies along our breakwater called the Minihuni Wall. So we can make a difference. Our community can make a difference and our visitors can help support it. Next slide, please, Louis. And for us, it is not about Oh, it's not only about the Makai, it is about the Malka. So the Kohala Center looks at an ahupua, our ahupua that gives us life. We say, ola kaina, ola ke kanaka, healthy land, healthy people. So we take care of the Malka lands. This is our forest project, Kohala Stewardship Program where our volunteers and our staff go out in Malama. And next slide, I, uh, Ui, please. And this slide is our work at New Lee, where uh, Hala Grove was neglected for years and years. And now we have um, restored it and, and cleaned it where a kupuna can now go in and, and reap the benefits of it. And so today, what we have is our uh, communities then learning again from our kupuna how to engage with this beautiful grove, hala grove and the beautiful products that we can share and teach our young ones. So mahalo Ui for letting me share. Mahalo so much auntie. Um, and we can tell that you are so passionate about what you do. And so we're so very grateful to all three of you um, as everyone I, I think on this panel, as well as that's taking part of this webinar knows nonprofit work is not easy. Um, financially not the most rewarding however in your puuvai it is it is the one thing that you know within your na'o it makes you so so grateful yeah to do the things that you do and so we mahalo you for all of the wonderful things you folks are doing across our paiaina across our, our islands across Hawaii um, and mahalo for all of the mana'o that you have shared and now we'd like to just get right into it and so we are going to be asking three uh, question sets and we will just kind of do a round robin. Um, I'll call on each of you to share. Um, so let's just jump right into it. So the first question set uh, that we'd like to ask is what are some key principles of culturally responsive tourism that have proven effective uh, for you folks and what you've seen here in Hawaii? And also, how can these principles be adapted to suit the unique needs and cultures of various tribal nations across the different regions? So let's go ahead and start with Olu on this one, if you don't mind. Yeah, you know, um, I really like the word choice in this question. Um, and I think it, it really speaks to the principle itself. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of ways you could frame this culturally sensitive, you know, culturally responsible, but you chose culturally responsive. 
And I think that's a very important principle that has helped um, push the needle in Hawaii towards a better system of tourism. Um, responsive, you know, it, re it requires action, right? And so I think just thinking of one principle is the the tourists, the tourism industry is a system. And when you're looking at a systemic uh, kind of issue, you got to have a systemic solution. And so when I think of how do you respond, how do you culturally respond to tourism, it needs to be as a systems approach. Um, so maybe that's just one principle that, that, that comes to mind. Um, and when, when I say systems approach, I mean, you have to you cannot, you cannot just have culturally responsible people or culturally knowledgeable people working on one piece of the industry like entertainment. It, it, that does not push the needle towards a better tourism system for our native communities. Um, you need those culturally knowledgeable and culturally responsible and the native people to be at every single part of the system. From the people who are investing in the system financially, from the people who are making decisions at the highest levels, of the companies who are involved in the industry, for the people who are working in the industry, to the people who are doing marketing for the industry, there needs to be that level of engagement in order for you to really have uh, a system that's beneficial to Native people. Um, I, I Just to be very clear, I do not think Hawaii's tourism system is there yet, but I think we've been pushing the envelope to really advance this type of approach, and it has created some, some positive progress. Um, the other thing that comes to mind when I think of principles is maybe just going back to something that the anti Cindy said a little earlier, and it's, you know, there's um, the connection between our people and our place is so important. And so in the work that Hawaii Land Trust does, we recognize that, you know, healthy lands, healthy people. And just to elaborate on what was said a little bit earlier, it comes down to that relationship. And it's really, a, it's really a relationship that we try to build in all of our work, because you can talk about concepts like, you know, be more culturally authentic or be more culturally appropriate. Um, but those, all those kind of things, they stem from, an, from a core understanding. Uh, and that understanding needs to be based upon our relationship. So when our people who are working in the tourism industry, for example, um, have a strong relationship with our place and our community, and they develop a value system uh, that values community and that values our place, then when they're working in the industry, they're going to be making decisions based upon that value system. And again, that's a systemic approach, and it's founded upon a strong relationship between our community and the places that are most meaningful to us. Um, and I'll just I'll just leave it there, and I'll, I'll let the next panelist talk. Mm -hmm. um, so much, Olu, for sharing. <laughs> Joylen, go ahead. I was gonna call yeah. you. <laughs> I saw my picture, pop up. I was like, it's my turn. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for mentioning all of that because that was actually something that I was going to touch upon too, is that um, culturally responsive tourism doesn't, in my mind, start with a tourist. It, it starts with our people and instilling or reviving that sense of pride with ha'a ha'a, with that humbleness that comes along with how we as Hawaiians um, should carry ourselves or have been taught by our kupuna to carry ourselves, but to always approach with aloha. So um, looking at the values that our people can, can um, relay to our tourists is one way of, of, of approaching this, this question. And uh, for example, um, the ha, it was really important to me that when I hired the crew uh, that they didn't necessarily need to be native Hawaiians, but they had to have that connection with being um, that a part of Hawaii. They had to um, have like Hawaii, you had to have respect for it, but you had to, have that understanding that we come from a very spiritual place and that the work that we put into restoring the wall builds mana. And then everybody who comes to this space provides their own type of mana. And so what kind of mana do you bring to our local? Um, so when I hired our staff, 
that was something I definitely looked for was that they came with the right intentions. And once I had a staff that um, was really focused on their, they represent our, not only our association, but also this program, but also the people of Hawaii, then they were empowered to be able to go and speak with the visitors that come there. We don't have as much visitors as Auntie Cindy then have. That is just astonishing. <laughs> but um, we, we average a good hundred or plus people at our shores every day. And so if the, the staff felt grounded in our culture, then they were able to relay that over to the visitors. And ironically, something that my staff has noticed is that um, it's not just the visitors that they were af um, affecting by educating people who come. There's a lot of residents here in Hawaii who were unaware about the cultural um, significance of Ko'i'i fish pond. So um, aloha is definitely a value that we treasure and um, we always did this regardless with having um, the idea of ho'ihi and respect, ho'ihi aku, ho'ihi mai. You give respect, you give respect, aloha aku, aloha mai, sing there with, with aloha, but um, we never necessarily um, labeled it until, until we got to do this program, which really um, helped us focus on that value too. So um, culturally responsive tourism, that's um, it begins with our people, with our our core staff, and then it um, resonates from there. And so, how these principles can be adapted to suit the unique needs and cultures of various nations across different regions. Um, another thing we're we're finding is we're getting a little older now ourselves or myself, and looking to the next generation. So bringing in those teenagers or those graduates that are um, coming in from or graduating from our local schools, especially here on Maui and um, saying, hey, we have opportunities for you to stay here in Hawaii and that you can make your difference in making Hawaii a better place and impacting tourism in a positive way by um, remaining here and promoting our culture in uh, an authentic way. I think uh, COVID has definitely been an eye opener for uh, the entire world that we need to rethink how we live, how we behave, and um, how we foresee our future, that we have the power to change it. And uh, this is one of those great ways that we've been able to do so, as long as we keep those core values there. So mahalo. Mahalo, Joy Lynn and Auntie. <laughs> well, you know, I, I just love the Olu and Joy Lynn's uh, comments because relationships and uh, uh, working with community, they're, they're so very important. And uh, the passion, you know, what Joy Lynn said, it doesn't always have to be Hawaiian. The passion of taking care of place, Malama, is part of, it's inside your na'au, and that is really important. For me, um, because we receive hundreds of people, thousands of people a year, um, relationship building is critical not only for community, but for the decision makers, for the state, the county, federal government. And throughout my years at uh, Kahalu, that was one of my goals is to create deep uh, uh, relationships with respect and trust and integrity. And as uh, the COVID pause came upon us, it was good and it was bad. But for us at Kahalu, prior to the COVID pause, our papa was completely dead. 
everyone coming to the INS stepped on it, killed everything. You couldn't see one, one limu growing there or algae. And so uh, we talked for almost nine months about how we're going to uh, um, engage the visitor when they come. And our foundation has always been if we engage and educate the visitor with aloha so they become part of the solution was really really important but we didn't have any strategies in place hot spots were talked about i i am a hot spot here on hawaii island a tourism hot spot so in october 2020 governor Ige decided to open up hawaii right? All the tourists coming, we didn't even have, we talked about plans. None of them were, were strategically in place. So uh, my volunteers, and, and I'll say, you know, when we closed in March of 2020, <clears throat> in two months, and that's all mother nature needs, two months, you could see the papa rejuvenate the Nemo coming back, the uh, uh, turtles were coming up, Honu grazing, all the keiki in, in on the tidal flats. It was brimming with life, abundant. Even the bay, the Hallelu schools were coming back in for years. We never saw that. Two months into the COVID pause. Now we want to open in October. We haven't put together any strategies. So I asked the county and the state and the federal government if I could do a pilot. I wanted to put a barrier in front of the papa. And they said to me, Cindy, I said, it's a pilot. They said, look, you put it up. If it doesn't work, take it down. So my whole idea was safety for the visitor because if they were walking on the papa, with the limo so slippery, a lot of them are falling and, and getting hurt. And showing them with uh, how to get in the bay was, was very important, but at the same time, taking care of place. Put up the barrier with those signs that with arrows showing a visitor how to get into the bay. With our, our volunteers there every day explaining why we have a barrier up and why it's important for their safety and why it's uh, now become a viewing area for the, for the visitor because the turtles are coming right in to graze. So you look at pilots that are win-win for the community, for the environment, for the visitor. And so till today, every day since two, October 15, 2020, the barrier goes up in the morning and comes down in the evening. So looking at not only uh, talking about strategies, but actually having them in place, sometimes physical barriers are important, especially for us when we're having a thousand people there and we can't reach everyone. We need to be able to, with aloha, explain to our visitors and believe it or not, it's, it's voluntary, it, there is no laws, but 99.9% .9 of them respect it and they don't go, they don't jump over it. So we're very, very blessed that way. Well, mahalo so much, Auntie, for sharing. And I think that's one thing that, you know, we have to remember as Native people, right? Our stories are all the same here in Hawaii um, and wherever you are, right, across, um, across the continent right you know our history has has the same story yeah. right and our and our values are the same right we value ohana and we value you know respect and mutual respect and all of those things and so i think i love what you shared olu about you know country culturally responsive yeah not yeah. just culturally sensitive or culturally aware it's culturally responsive so i think a lot of the tribal tribal nations can look to their own values as well yeah, yeah? and and see like this is what we can put in place for our people because yeah. this is what our people needs and you know and you do it and so mahalo mahalo for all of that manao um 
in respect of time, I want to move on to our next question. Um, so our next question, and I'll I'll start with you, Joylen, this time. Um, what are the challenges or potential pitfalls associated with implementing culturally responsive tourism initiatives um, that you yourself have encountered um, or you've seen other organizations encounter you know, in the context of Hawaii? And also, how are these challenges addressed and what advice can you share for our tribal nations to navigate maybe similar obstacles that they may face um, when initiating these things as well? <laughs> I can speak for our site that because of the location, it has traditionally, when I'm and I'm speaking for the last 30 years, 40 years, been a place of recreation. And so the community knows this fish pond as a place for people to just come, swim, um, fish. And so that in itself has been a real challenge over the years that we want to have this revitalized into a working fish pond. But um, the challenge is that it hasn't in the recent history been used that way. And so to change the community's perspective of what this place is has been always a, um, a challenge slash goal of ours. And that's why we do the work that we do. We regularly are educating our school groups and community organizations and have volunteer opportunities for people to come and learn more that this is not just a place with a rock wall. It's it's not like a harbor or any place you wanna go regularly swimming in. It has this beautiful historical value that needs to be learned and respected. And so I, I would say the major challenge has been that overturning of the community's perspective of what uh, certain places can be like Auntie um, Cindy mentioned it's it's a vahipana and honestly especially because I would say the last 30 years with our Hawaiian renaissance and that our Hawaiian language has been revitalized so much especially here on Maui we have a very large community of, um, of speakers that there is this cultural pride in our current generation and they are just yearning to kue, you know, like they want to just take over and say enough is enough. And um, it's time to revert back to um, our ikikuna, to go back to what we we um, know is in our na'o, that it's the right thing to do is to raise fish the way how we did it. And there's been some really successful organizations throughout the state that have been able to do so in the last 20 years. And uh, we definitely would look forward to having Ko'i'i'i Fish Pond be one of those success stories too, but dealing with our, our public has been one of those challenges. The Hawaiians want it to be back to a native working fish pond, and so would I, but uh, how do we stop people from uh, viewing it? So this this grant has helped us get a better understanding of our audience and the people that use the space, what they use it for, um, how often they come and visit. And then we take that information and try to see how can we make the best impact educationally to um, move us to the next step. So um, I, I think did I answer both questions there in a nutshell? Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, sorry. I no, I think it's something that our kupuna would be very, I love that you talked about the Renaissance, right? Because we have, we have our <laughs> kiki who are like, let's do this. Let's get these things going and let's right. get our way back. And, and I think what our ancestors have always taught us too, though, is that we do things with aloha, right? And so, you know, we've had this history of all of the, the um, you know, the people that have come before us, right, in the 70s and 80s who have, have done the hard fighting, have done, you know, and now it's like, now we do the strategic fighting right and so right. I love it I love that you folks you folks are taking that route um Olu can you share your mana on this question 
Yeah, I'd love to. Um, a few things come to mind. One, and this is going to sound repetitive with what I said earlier, but it's a challenge to implement culturally responsive tourism when the decision makers in the tourism industry don't have an understanding of, of our culture and our community, uh, which is a very common practice because a lot of the, you know, a lot of the businesses operating tour, uh, in tourism in Hawaii are foreign companies uh, and, their, and their leaders are not from here. Um, so that that's a challenge. Um, and education only goes so far. I think we would all agree that somebody who was raised in a community and with a certain culture will always make decisions in a different way than somebody who's just being educated about it, it's kind of like in a secondhand way. And so that's kind of an ongoing issue. And like I said earlier, it requires Native people to get involved in ways that are impactful in the industry. Um, and as you know, from, from the perspective of Hawaii Land Trust, you know, what we try to do is we try to take people out to do that type of relationship building and education so that they can start to have that value set. But again, it's it's an uphill battle. Um, the second thing that I think about is a, a second challenge I think about is, and this is kind of similar to what uh Jordan mentioned, but like visitor expectations of what what to do when they come to Hawaii is different, often different than what the community's expectations are of tourists when they come to Hawaii. And so that's an ongoing challenge and it requires better marketing, honestly. And that's something that is a strategy that Hawaiians are, are working towards. Um, thanks to those people like people at the Native, uh, sorry, the Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement um, and being able to attract tourists who are, um, are more open-minded to being culturally sensitive and appropriate and behaving like that when they're here and to set that expectation so that when people come here, they're not just thinking, oh, I can go do whatever I want. I have to follow a certain protocol because that's how that's how things are done in this place. Um, I think that's really important. And maybe the last thing, and this is, um, tourism isn't, I, I don't believe tourism is the best economic model for every community. Um, you know, Referring back to COVID again, I'm sorry for, for touching upon that so many times in this panel, but COVID disproportionately impacted Native Hawaiians because Native Hawaiians are disproportionately involved in the tourism industry here. And Hawaii's over-reliance on tourism and a lot of the low-paying jobs that the tourism industry has provided was not good for the Hawaiian community. And as a result, Hawaii is actively trying to diversify our economy away from tourism to industries that we feel are more resilient. And that's one of the reasons Hawaii Land Trust has such a big focus on supporting our food systems work, because we believe that is a more resilient industry. Uh, I'm not saying that communities shouldn't explore tourism, but I believe, you know, our Native peoples need to look at the tourism economic model, look at the business model, understand how it works intimately. And is it going to be extractive to a Native community or is it going to be um, regenerative for that Native community? And so that's maybe the, the final thought I have about this question. Mahalo, Olu. Auntie, mana o? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm uh, listening to Olu and, and Jordan. Um, all of those things are so important, you know, and that's why you need your whole community to be embraced. For us, I have created uh, programs adopt a day at Kahalu Bay where our businesses, because they're uh, they're busy, we will go out and teach them reef etiquette, how to educate the visitor when they're at not only at Kahalu but any bay, because corals are corals wherever you go, and how to uh, uh, malama. But we go into the hotels, we go into the schools, we go uh, into the, um, even the trolleys that come to the bay and we, we educate them so, and their employees so that they, and even Expedia people, so they can educate the visitors while they're here and actually uh, before they get to the uh, bay, they already have an idea of what to do, you know, for, for, and, and it's, it's, the challenges are those things 
um, where you you want to because Kahulu Bay is an economic driver, it takes care of our children's put food on the table. It takes care of our restaurants, our all of all of that. That's why they come to Kona. They come to Kona because it is one of the most beautiful coral reefs on our island. But our challenges are our funding, you know, grants run out. So uh, you can get a grant for a year and then you may not get a grant for another year. So it's really a, a constant looking for funding too, looking for donors. But that's why what important for me was to create maintenance funding. So the first ever parking fee, visitor parking fee pilot I established here on Hawaii Island at Kahalu Bay. All of the funds for that bay go into stewardship of Kahalu Bay. And I keep really good records and I account for every penny to the county of Hawaii. But that money is take care of my programs so that we can continue without thinking, oh God, am I, will I be able to uh, pay our staff next month? But it gives me more time to think about those things that are other challenges that are so important. How do I take care of a, of a shallow bay that thousands of people are coming to every day. So I have um, uh, made, part. I, I create partnerships. Right now we're building the largest coral nursery in the world on Hawaii Island, right at Host Park. And uh, Dr. Greg Ashner is heading it with the uh, Arizona State University, hiring young people to do work within that environment. But I feel it's important because when we start to outplant, I can then look at parts of the bay to exclude people from going into certain areas where we are doing restoration. But I also truly believe that the visitor needs to be part of that situation, need to be part of, of of that kind of um, uh, project. So even if you created a package with the hotel that said, to, if you want to come to Hawaii for this uh, package, you can be part of a team that go out and, and, and plant a coral. You will be part of this team. But I think we need to, we need to think about these, these projects as we start to transition into sustainability, I see all these ungulates all over, and there and and we should be looking at uh, programs and projects that can uh, can maintain them. So we balance out the feral pigs and the and the goats that uh, that are there and, and, and start feeding our people. We need to do those things too. But then that brings another industry in that takes away from tourism so that we don't have to depend on tourism. There'll always be tourists, but you don't have to depend on them. You can start other industries that can support our children. When I grew, graduated, I had to leave Hawaii because I didn't feel I had a place where I could take care of a family. I don't want my children to think that way. I want my children to have a good job so that they can stay home if they want to. Like Ulu said, a choice. They want to stay home or they want to go. It's up to them, but they can buy a house. They can get, buy a car. They can raise a family. That's what I want for our children. 
Mahalo so much, Auntie. Um, mahalo for all of that mana'o. So let's move on to our next question. Um, as the tourism industry evolves, because we definitely know that it is evolving, I think COVID has been one of the hugest things that have made us realize um, this evolution. Um, and as travel patterns change, how do you envision the future of culturally sensitive and responsive tourism uh, for both Native Hawaiians and tribal communities? Um, and also what innovations or approaches do you believe will be crucial in maximizing the benefits of this form of tourism in the long term? Um, Olu, if we can start with you. Yeah, can do. Um, I think, and this is this kind of maybe goes back to something I said earlier, but I think the history of tourism in Native communities hasn't been the most positive one. And I think going forward, our communities will kind of continue to reassess the value that tourism has uh, um, to support the well-being of our people. Um, where tourism does continue, I would foresee that more engagement from Native people in important roles in the industry will drive the industry towards more culturally minded and culturally um, responsive tourism. At least that that would be my hope. Um, and, I, and I think with that, I would hope that there's more community benefit coming out of the industry that operates in that uh, in that manner. I'm thinking about the, the second part of the question about innovations that maximize the benefit. And what comes to my mind is, and this is an idea that's not unique to tourism. And it's something that here in Hawaii, Hawaiians are really trying to do across the, the spectrum of industry. And, um, and it's, the, it's the idea that culture can't be just a topping. Um, it can't be something that you just sprinkle on the top that says, oh, and look, there's Hawaiians here and they do, do these cool dances and sing songs and stuff like that's that doesn't cut it. That doesn't create any benefit towards our people. Um, culture needs to be foundational. The values of our pe people need to be foundational in the industry and decisions in the industry need to be made upon that cultural foundation um, so that the industry can truly benefit to the greatest extent possible the the people who are working in it um yeah i i think i think that's that's what i would say is the most important thing maximizing the benefit is really to try to integrate uh the values of our people into the industries that that we're working in mahalo so much olu um Jaylen? yeah mahalo nui um you know something i haven't touched on but it's very dear to our hearts here on maui is the the wildfires that happened in August. And I am not from Lahaina, and I am from Kula. I live up in up country, but um, I'm definitely not speaking for our people of Lahaina, but just seeing things unfold in the last two and a half months or so has been um, exciting at the possibilities of what could potentially happen for the area of Lahaina, but then also scary because this is like a key turning point for people to see, have you learned your lesson yet? Yeah, like COVID, we saw all this beautiful change that unexpectedly arose from such a horrible situation where our marine life returned, our environment returned, that feeling of aloha, hula, aloha mai happened, People were trading goods and being like, I got too much of this, but you need this here. Let me just give money, money involved. Yeah, now money has always been a driving force. And um, early on when we had the fires in August, it was exciting to see the potential that the people of Lahaina was able to have a, a main voice in how Lahaina would be remade. And government had committed to listening to that voice and let Lahaina be rebuilt the way how the people of Lahaina wanted to. Yes, there's definitely the Native Hawaiian groups there, but there's also the Filipinos, there's also the Japanese, there's all, it's such a multicultural melting pot within just a few square miles that all these people have their idea of, we've experienced Lahaina as a major tourism industry. However, how do we move 
into a way that the people want to rebuild Lahaina to still support tourism, but is tourism gonna be the main attraction? And um, this kind of combines earlier responses that I had about the Hawaiian Renaissance, that it has really moved people forward. Like we want to have our Bahipana brought back. We don't want Smoku'ula to be a baseball field anymore. We want it to be revitalized into the, um, what was once the capital of, of Hawaii, you know, this is where our ali'i lived. They are, they are laid to rest right there in that area. So there's um, this cultural i'ini within Native Hawaiians, as well as just the people of the area that um, are here on Maui, I'm sure throughout the state, that want to see this great opportunity move forward. But the challenge is, um, money always seems to drive the way how we move forward and um, governments has good intentions i think on making it available for the people to determine how to move tourism in a positive way for everyone however when money is a driving force that seems to kind of take precedence and we need to make sure people are um, grounded in in more cultural values versus uh, monetary values. I know it's a it's a catch twenty two. Some people might disagree with that, but um, I think what makes Hawaii Hawaiian so special is that we live with aloha first versus um, our value, our vai vai ness is in the aina, is in the vai, is in the water. And it's in our cultural, our environmental resources. And so if we take advantage of that and we do not um, malama that, then culturally that's, um, we're gonna be unsuccessful. And that's, we, we have hundreds or over a thousand years of our kupuna who live successively on these islands without any type of money involved, but then just us 200 years or plus that uh, of history, money has been the driving force. So switching that mana'o that uh, we, we have definitely a history <laughs> in, um, in our kupuna that we have to uh, put at the forefront of how we move forward with tourism, with taking care of our aina. Because if we don't have this beautiful aina for tourists to enjoy, they're not going to want to come here, right? So <laughs> anyways. Mahalo, mahalo no kela. Um, Auntie Cindy, your mana'o? Well, you've, they've talked, Joy Lynn and Olu have said uh, a lot that I was thinking. And, uh, you know, uh, to, we really need our leaders to really listen and act, act. You know, um, we need to really look at carrying capacity and, and really, really understand what it means for a place. You can't have a thousand people every day, every day <laughs> coming to a small place. It just, won't work, but it's hard, uh, uh, you know, relate, we have great relationships. I, I, I'm very uh, grateful for the relationships we've built with our state and our um, county, uh, but it seems that uh, it takes so long for decisions to be made, years and years. Our, even our wastewater systems that are killing our aina, our, our corals, uh, our, we, it's been, I've been working on this uh, problem over 30 years now, and still uh, kicking the can down the road. We can't shame on us if we leave these problems for our children, especially when we know what to do today, you know, 
10 years from now, it's going to cost a billion dollars for them to fix it. But yet we talk about today, oh, it's a million dollars. It's going to cost us millions. We can't think like that. We have to just stand up and, and act. And, and we need everyone. We need everyone to work together. Uh, we need to educate our visitors. We need our traditional knowledge to be uh, a forefront, you know, honoring our past so we enrich our future. We need these things. They're not just words. They're really embedded in us. It's innate. And passing it on to our children. We're so glad. Yesterday, I was doing oral history with, with uh, some of our young ones at the University of Hawaii. And I'm so grateful that these young ones understand that we're passing the torch to them. And they are looking at balance, at pono, truly understanding what pono is, a harmony and balance for the aina, for the people, and for everyone that we touch. You know, I truly, truly, um, 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 I, I think, as we move forward, we, and, and John DeFries did this, and I saw everything going on in the legislature, but I know what he was trying to do, and it is to build the sense of pono, to, to build a sense of understanding our culture and taking care and malama, a sense of place, and refocusing this shift of recreational tourism to ecological understanding in a cultural a sensitive way. But we need, to, we need to continue to do this. Talk is cheap. We're at a tipping point now. We don't do things. It's gonna to be too late. We need to do things now. But I'm very grateful that we all can come together because I think for tribal nations, for us, we're all tribal. We all live off the land. You know, we all love our lands. They give us life. You know, my dad and I used to go holo holo all the time. He we go go throw a net, and he would always say, You treat the aina like your sweetheart then it will always take care of you, always. And you do, and all I ask of you, baby, is to do your very best. And that's what we need to do, our very best for our keiki. Not just talk about our very best, but do our very best. Mahalo. Mahalo so much, Auntie, and, and that brings so much um, awareness to, to, you know, exactly what it is, right? Like, you know, rewriting the script, yeah, rewriting our history, um, because we know as Native Hawaiians and also, you know, our, our tribal nations, they know, right? We haven't always, as Indigenous people, we haven't always been treated um, how we deserved and the best that we should be. Our aina hasn't always been treated that way. And so, you know, mahalo for all of the mana'o you folks have shared, because yes, it is building those relationships with the people who have that power, right? And have the things to do. It is the mani, it is, you know, but I think just always remembering that we are deserved this. As Indigenous people, we deserve all of these things, yeah? And our aina deserves it, our keiki deserve it, our, our our, our uh, future deserves it, yeah. And so I think having the right people in there, um, people like you is, is, you know, all of you for doing the things that you do, we're, we're definitely hola moing and moving forward into the, direct, the right direction. Um, so mahalo for all of that mana'o. Um, we did have a couple of questions that came up. Um, I'm scrolling through here. And one of the questions um, that came up uh, talked about having um, who wrote it. Sorry, 
There was a question that came up about, you know, how or where do you start to teach tourists how to be culturally sensitive? Um, any one of our panelists want to take a shot at that? Well, I can try because I've been doing it for almost 20 years. <laughs> but when, when a visitor comes up to us uh, at Kahagu, um, our foundation, as I had mentioned, is always aloha. So the first thing you want to do, you have 10 seconds to do this, is try to break a barrier. So you ask, oh, where are you from? Oh, welcome to Kahalu Bay. And so you break down that barrier and then you talk story with them, not tell them what to do, not, uh, but, but talk about the place. I talk about growing up at Kahalu, but, um, but I want you to be safe. And, and, and once they break down a barrier that I don't know you barrier, then it's very easy to start your conversation. And, and most 99% of the people will do that. And, and that's, how you, that's how you can get through to them. But just starting, to ask them and be very uh, polite and welcoming. I, I can chime into that as well. Thank you, Auntie. With building rapport with the uh, visitors is definitely um, a great way to start off the conversation. Um, something we found to be really helpful too is that we um, talk metaphors um, because Turtles are so prominent on at our fish pond at this time that we um, say, hey, yeah, the turtle is there, the hono is there. It's wonderful to see, but it's resting right now. How would you feel if you were at home and someone walked into your house and started harassing you or speaking loudly to you while you're sleeping? So try to like put it in a, uh, put the messages in a way where people can relate to is a great strategy that we used. And I'm, I am happy to see that a lot of the people that visit our local um, are people who are willing to learn. Um, sometimes they just wanna hang out and just talk story. <laughs> and um, my staff is like, oh, you know, that person was here for like 20 plus minutes because they just wanted to know about Hawaii and my staff hasn't um, is more than willing to share share that because just finding that what does the visitor want to le learn more of and trying to make it a positive message and uh, relay really um, a way of of being able to care for Hawaii in a positive way happy to chime in too um you know we have on, on our sites we have a lot of uh, tourists who visit just on their own without any of our team there. Um, and so yeah, I, I kind of think about it as like proactive strategies and, and more reactive strategies. So on like the proactive side comes to things like we talked about earlier, like marketing, um, like marketing to tourists who are going to be more inclined to be culturally sensitive um, and setting proper expectations in the marketing of how they should behave when they arrive in Hawaii and they're they're um, at a at a place of community cultural significance, um, and so really the education can start at, at that point. Um, and then when people are here, of course, you know, and face to face conversations are the best, but sometimes that's not possible. And so we also have other strategies that we employ, like um, like good signage um, and just you know signage that's very clear. Uh, about what what your behavior should be on this site, where you shouldn't go, where you can go, all those things are very helpful. And you know, this is a maybe this is a proactive strategy. So maybe I should have said it earlier. But you know, one other thing that is really important is knowing what, being able to control to the greatest extent possible what information is being shared. So like we have certain sites on the Aina that we take care of that we intentionally try to avoid any publicity on because we don't want people to come there who don't have a connection to that place. And so being able to be very thoughtful about how you're 
even like as we market our, ourselves like to donors and, and community partners, we're very intentional about the way that we do that because we know whatever information goes out into the public can go anywhere. Uh, and so we're very careful about the type of information that we share to make sure that we're not attracting attention to places that we don't want people to go to. Can I add one more one more quick strategy too is um, is partnerships because uh, at our particular site the humpback whale sanctuary is right there they get a have a visitor center and a lot of people come in regularly to um, learn about the whale sanctuary but then they also help educate about the fish pond so it's about um, making sure you and your partners have the the same messages that you guys are all on the same page sharing the same information with the public because then um, more more organizations out there sharing the information will help benefit in the long run and and to cindy's project is, and as well as olu's because i through another nonprofit, i'm more partner with them too but um partnerships really help out with spreading your message and multiplying it I think that also sends a message of like, we are, you know, hooing together, we're doing this, right? As a la hui, we're coming together and we're doing the things that we need to do. And, and so mahalo, mahalo for sharing that mana'o. Um, a couple of other questions that came up, um, ANA funding. Uh, yes, Hawaii is very blessed to have an outstanding ANA team. Um, they put on wonderful uh, trainings and, and, you know, all of those things. And I think, Having such a great ANA support team, um, TA team has also been part of the reasons why we've different organizations throughout Hawaii have gotten um, ANA grants. And at one point we were kind of, um, our region was getting a little bit more than the other regions and, and it did get noticed and talked about. So we're very, very blessed to have an amazing ANA team, a TA team here. Um, and then to answer your question, Ty, have, um, I asked about partnering through airlines, um, you know, to sending out information, do's and don'ts. And, and we have, Hawaiian Airlines has um, stepped up their game and they have put out informational videos on all of their flights coming into Hawaii and going out of Hawaii. Um, and so that's helped. I think partnering with other airlines also would be, would be key, um, you know, but then again, it goes into that whole discussion of, of, you know, also them wanting to, to do that partnership and wanting to share that, that manao with the visitors as well. Yeah. So yes, we are very blessed to also have that um, partnership with Hawaiian Airlines um, and sharing our visitor information and they, and I'm so proud of the videos that they put on um, primarily because they feature um, a lot of the videos do feature native Hawaiian practitioners and uh, people that are kama'aina to, um, to the to the vahipana that they're speaking upon yeah um we were one of the organizations featured in those videos yeah i saw you guys <laughs> i saw you guys uh, <laughs> kikaiola is too our uh, uh, uh monk's hill hospital here on hawaii island yeah, yeah. Very yeah, good. so they do. Yeah, they do a great job. Um, they do have some DLNR videos on there. Um, yeah. yeah, and a lot of things. Um, so, uh, well, I just want to say mahalo to everyone for joining us today. Um, before we, we head off, I'd like to just kind of share, as Olu mentioned, we do have so many great organizations doing great things. Uh, the partnerships are so crucial and so important uh, for us to hold on one to go forward. And I think that's definitely something that tribal nations can look, look at um, as an example as well, is that Hawaii is very, very small or very tight knit, even though we are you know, separated um, by our kai throughout the different islands that doesn't stop us from hooing together and working together. And so I just wanted to highlight real briefly um, on some of the other organizations that are, that are doing great things. Um, we do have Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement. They also are putting on, um, uh, 
I think they're doing like a conference, uh, which I believe starts tomorrow, um, and they're touching on tourism as well. Um, a Native Wine Hospitality Association, Naha, who is also one of our, who was also one of our Hui'ihi grantees, Hana Arts, Holani Hana, both in Hana Maui, uh, Waimea Hawaiian Homesteaders Association, Hi'ipaka LLC, which is also known um, more, I guess, as Waimea Valley, um, and Hanalei River Heritage Foundation, um, who I believe is on now, who logged on for our, <laughs> Camilo who logged on for our webinar. So they're doing great things too here on Koi, my home island. Um, and also Hui Makainana o Makana uh, in partnership with the Hanalei Initiative. And these guys, um, my gosh, they have done wonderful work out in Haena, Koi. Um, so if you have a chance to, um, to kind of, oops, sorry. What happened? Uh, sorry. Um, if you have a chance to uh, take a look at their work that they have done, they've done some pretty amazing things, um, as well as Kako'o O'ivi and Malama Loko'ea um, on O'ahu. So just to highlight a few of our wonderful, we have many more that are doing great things in, in, our, um, in our islands, um, but just a few, yes, just a few that are doing awesome things. Um, so kind of to just wrap up, mahalo Olu, Joy Lynn, and Auntie Cindy for joining us today. Mahalo for sharing all of your mana'o um, and your strategies that you've been so working so hard on, you know, to, to kind of rewrite the script of tourism here in Hawaii and making it more culturally responsive, culturally sensitive, and more regenerative. Um, mahalo to um, OIED for coming and, and for believing in us and helping us to, to get the Native Act funds, as well as the Office of Native Hawaiian Relations, Ka'aleleo, for doing all of the things that you do. Um, as we all know, Hawaii is such a special and sacred place. Our Hawaiian ancestors were extremely aware of the many treasure, treasures that I know Hawaii holds um, as they chose Hawaii to be their island home when they migrated over from areas such as Tahiti, Marquesas, and Aotearoa. Hawaii's favorable climate and tropical landscape, our beautiful beaches, and our outstanding culture make it the perfect place for visitors from all over the world. Um, in 2017 alone, we, the government estimated that we had gotten, we had gotten nine point, over 9.4 million visitors to the Hawaiian Islands um, with expenditures of over $16 billion. So tourism definitely drives our, our, our economy. Um, and tourism comprises of more than 20% of our state's economy with many of Hawaii's largest industries revolving around the constant flow of tourists. With that being said, we as Native Hawaiians and stewards of our aina have an obligation to care for, protect, perpetuate a malama or aina, our precious home, Hawaii, which strengthen awareness through groups um, such as Hawaii Island Land Trust, um, Ao Ao Na Loko I Ao Maui, as well as the Kohala Center. Um, we as Kama Aina are natives to our land. Uh, it is our kuleana to rewrite the script um, and write the script for regenerative tourism and culturally responsive tourism here in Hawaii. So as our last reigning mo'i, Queen Lili Uokalani, once said, never cease to act because you fear you may fail. And the true secret is to know your own worth. It will carry you through many dangers. And we as native people to our aina, to our lands must always remember this. The time has come for us to take charge, to be in charge and be the keepers of our resources and our lands. So mahalo nui everyone. And with that being said, I bid you all a fond farewell, aloha and mahalo. Mahalo, aloha. Aloha, mahalo. Mahalo. Uiho, auntie, have a Amo good day. Uiho, malama pono. Malama pono, mahalo.
all of you joining us. Mahalo for that. Um, just trying to figure out. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so 